transformed. And where we are today and where we are going tomorrow is what we're going to be talking about this morning. I hope this will be a great day, a great day that will open our eyes to what is possible and our hearts to what we need to do and to our minds as to what we need to think about and together collectively begin to look at how we transform the fortunes of this nation through education. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, education, is what the whole world is pursuing. Any country that you go to, people are talking about STEM. STEM is what should occupy us. But I'm not talking about STEM that excludes the arts. Well-rounded individuals, be they architects, are engineers, do a good job and do a fine job when they can play music and when they can appreciate music and when they can draw and when they can really think with a holistic perspective. So we are not thinking about STEM without the arts. And that is why in some countries, they are not talking about STEM, they are talking about STEAM. And a number of times people come to me and say, why are you excluding the arts? And I'm saying, no, we are not. In America, when they began the STEM, it took them some time. They were able to really implement the STEM. And then they say, oh, the arts should not be left behind. So we are not going to make that mistake of beginning with STEM and leaving out the arts. But because we have not mastered the STEM yet, I don't want to confuse people by adding the A to make it STEAM. And they will say, what happened to STEM? So that is why you're going to hear me talking about STEM. But it's not to the exclusion of the arts. Because a well-rounded individual will become a better architect and will become a better engineer and will be a better medical doctor. So the arts will not be excluded from our discussion. So are we also not excluding TVET. Invariably, people talk about TVET as if it has nothing to do with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But TVET is front and center of STEM. And the German TVET that transformed their fortunes was not the TVET that excluded innovation. It wasn't the TVET that excluded science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It was TVET that infused science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So that in the garage of an individual, he'll be innovating and inventing. And when they invent and create a model and design and build it, that became the reason why Germany used TVET for its socioeconomic transformation. So in Ghana, as we hear more about the present agenda for TVET, it is not to the exclusion of a strong foundation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that is why the best TVET innovators of this nation shouldn't be the ones that we think are not sharp enough to do the general arts and therefore say go to STEM. No, they should be our best minds. Our best minds should be the one engaged in TVET because that is where we need the implementation, innovation skills built on the foundation of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I know my speech writers always are concerned that I'll go off the script. <laughs> so as I said, the last time I came to UST, I'll help them a bit by reading some of the things that they wrote. <laughs> but at a point, I may be off the script. And we'll talk about where we want to get to as a nation. So as speech writers, for you to be happy, I will put on my glasses. <laughs> I'll put on my glasses, and um, it makes me look different. And then... Um, Look at some of the things you have written. You know, since the days of God in Gagesburg and the colonial days up to the present, there has always been the desire that will create an education system that will transform the fortunes of our nation. Recently, not too long ago, I had a wonderful opportunity of sitting in a meeting at the Ministry of Education we received some guests from South Korea. They had come to Ghana to give us a loan to build the second campus of the Eastern University, the one at Bunso. In fact, the contract has recently been signed 
and the Bunsu campus is going to begin. And the construction of engineering schools and other schools are going to begin at Bunsu. But when they came to us a few months ago, over maybe a year plus, we had a wonderful conversation at the Ministry of Education. They did a presentation and showed us three simple graphs. Very simple graphs. The first graph was the per capita income of South Korea and Ghana, 1960. And then the current compared. Of course, in 1960, our per capita income as a nation was higher than theirs. We were richer than them in 1960. Then they showed us the current, and of course, they are way up there. We are not even close. Then they asked us in the meeting, why do you think we got ahead of you? Because you were richer than us in 1960. Our per capita income there was $189, and theirs was 154 And they asked us in the room. And um, it was an interesting conversation. Interesting conversation in the sense that if somebody comes from his country and asks you, how did I become richer than you? And why am I better than you? It's an uncomfortable kind of conversation. But in that conversation, they asked us. And of course, we couldn't respond. And they showed us a third graph. And the graph was comparing the gross tertiary enrollment ratio of Ghana and South Korea. And I want to break it down so that everybody in this room, by the time you leave here, if you did not know, will know what is the gross tertiary enrollment ratio of a nation or a community. I always use the example of a village in my constituency called Bonkoko. So if you visit Bonkoko and you ask the chief of the town, Nana, how many of your youth are between the ages of 18 to 22? And if Nana responds that I have 100 of them, let's assume for the moment that he has counted already. And he knows that he has 100 youth between the ages of 18 to 22. And if you ask a follow-up question, Nana, how many people are at the tertiary education level, irrespective of age? If Nana responds, I have 10 of them, that means Bongo Kors gross tertiary enrollment ratio is 10%. 10 percent. 10 people in tertiary out of um, eight, in, out of 100 between the ages of 18 to 22. Why do we say gross? The number at the top, the 10, is everyone. The number at the bottom, the 100, is just for those between 18 to 22. So it's gross. If you wanted the net, then we only look at those between 18 to 22 who are in tertiary. But long story short, if you have a gross tertiary enrollment ratio of 10, and another community has 20%, the community of 20% is going to be better off than the community with 10%. A country with a gross tertiary enrollment ratio of 80, 80% is going to be better off than a country whose gross enrollment ratio is 18.8%. So when the South Koreans showed us the third graph, it was the gross tertiary enrollment ratio of Ghana and that of South Korea compared. And if you look at the bar graph, we were not nowhere close to them. At that time, our gross tertiary enrollment ratio was 16%. Today it's 18.8%. But the South Koreans is 96.3%. So they told us the reason why we are in Ghana to give you the loan is for you to move up your gross tertiary enrollment ratio. Because if you don't move this up, there's no way you can transform the fortunes of your country. They say you may wish that you become like us, but if your gross tertiary enrollment ratio doesn't move up, if you don't move up to the point where you are 40%, 50%, your growth will not be sustainable. There will be backwards and forward swings. Times the economy is good, times the economy is not good, because you don't have the critical mass of people who can change your country. So when we talk about the gross tertiary enrollment ratio, it's one important metric that if you can track, you know your country is changing. So Ghana is 18.8%, South Korea is 96.3%, and that is why the President of the Republic, Nanado Danko Kufuado, 
during the last State of the Nation address, told the country that he wants to move the gross tertiary enrollment ratio of Ghana from the current 18.8 percent to 40 percent by 2030. That is his charge to me as the Minister of Education and his charge to us as a nation, that we need to move these numbers up. Mauritius is 40 percent. And all those nations that hit 40 percent, you see transformation. You see that the country is really changing. But it is not just increasing the numbers. It's equally important to look at what the numbers represent. If you move it to 40 percent, how many of them are pursuing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? And why do I say that? Because around the world, all sectors of the economy, the labor force is growing by 4%. But that of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is growing by 14%. So when your country produces the requisite manpower in the form of engineers, medical doctors, and other fields that are very much needed, for socioeconomic transformation, then you transform. Last evening, Sunday, I was, after church, I was in the office. I received a guest from America. These individuals are here to recruit Ghanaian workers to work for them, and they work from Ghana. They work from Ghana, and they receive international salaries. And what that they are saying is that they need individuals who can do programming who can do engineering programs. And once they can have them, they'll be managing companies right from here. The world has changed. And we have to change in order to keep up. We can train the labor force that will meet the requirements of our nation and also meet the requirements of the global workforce. Position us as a nation to see total transformation. So when we talk about the gross tertiary enrollment ratio, how do we move up the gross tertiary enrollment ratio when secondary education numbers are not moving up? So when you hear about the free senior high school, it's not a campaign promise. It's not just a gimmick to really throw that in the eyes of Ghanaians because the president promised and wanted to at all costs execute it. You hear about double track and some people will say, why do you have to spend all your time on this? How do you move up the gross tertiary enrollment of your nation when the vast majority of your youth don't have access to secondary? I always say that in this country of ours, in terms of talent, we have two ponds. If talent was fish, you can say that we have two fish ponds. We have the pond for the rich and the advantage in society and the pond of the poor and deprived. In the point of the rich and advantage, their children are well to do. They get to become medical doctors, they get to become engineers. The nation uses their talent very well to support the socioeconomic transformation agenda. But in the point of the poor, we have talent there that has not been tapped. We have people who have so much potential but will not get the opportunity to sit in this room. So when free senior high school is being implemented, it's being implemented with the focus to making sure we can tap into the talent of all. Because you see, it's not that child who has lost us, it's the nation that has lost out because we did not tap his talent for the total transformation of this nation. When the idea of double track was first muted and we met the president, he said something very profound. The president said something, he said, if using double track will enable you to educate the vast majority of Ghanaians, go ahead and use it. Because I don't know from which village a great inventor will emerge whose ideas will change this nation forever. So create an opportunity for everyone to be educated. And out of that, we may find someone who may be the next Einstein of Ghana, of Africa, and of the world. In various communities around the world, in the Zongos and in the villages, are raw talents. Individuals who God has endowed with great talents and great ideas, and if we can nurture them, our nation will change. So today when we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we are not simply talking about people pursuing science. People pursuing technology, people pursuing engineering and mathematics. No, that is not STEM. 
The concept of STEM is using all these ideas to solve problems and innovate, build new uh, schools that may look different, using new technology, building, construction, aspect of things, and not just that, programming, engineering, manufacturing and assembling of vehicles, great ideas that will change the fortunes of this nation is going to come when we train the youth to use ideas from all these fields in solving the world's problems and challenges. So you see, the world went through the first industrial revolution. During the first industrial revolution, James Watt, in 1789, invented the steam engine. It led to industrialization. That was during the colonial era. We missed it. Then came the second industrial revolution, electricity, which led to manufacturing on a very large scale. Our nation was not front and center of that. Then came the third industrial revolution of 1969. Invention of computer and electronics leading to automation. We missed it. Now we are in the fourth industrial revolution, the fusion of the physical and biological the Internet of Things, be able to sit here and log into a home and see what is in there. Check even what is in your refrigerator. Enter your house with the biometric identification, which is your eyes. The fusion of the biological. The world is changing. The fourth industrial revolution is requiring, which is the Industry 4.0, is requiring a, that we do education 4.0 in response to the fourth industrial revolution. So things are shifting. Things are changing. And what do we need to do? What we need to do is to change our education system to meet that need. And to meet that need means that we need to focus on STEM education. We need to train the young men and women who lead the world in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Who lead the world in critical thinking? Who lead the world in innovation? And that is the kind of education system we need to create. But make no mistake about it. We are also fully aware of the challenges facing our education system. So for those who think, hey, how, how can you do all this time when we have these challenges? The president, the ministry, is fully aware of the challenges. That is why. During the last four or five years, there has been massive construction in the secondary education space. There are a number of dilapidated schools that have been reconstructed. Because we know we have to do a good job at that in order to lay a strong foundation for STEM education. Ghana will be a great nation because we engage in STEM. Now, the foundation of STEM, as I've already pointed out. Now, let, let me go to the script. <laughs> we need to have a strong literacy and numeracy foundation and proficiency. That is why we're implementing the national standardized test for progress evaluation. That no longer would our nation wait till 11 years after students enroll in school before we know whether they're doing well or not. So all primary four students are going to be assessed this year. We also need to introduce intervention for less proficient pupils. If a student is not doing well at the junior high school level, we need to give and is not reading well, they need an additional English language class and not additional subjects that they cannot master. I don't understand why a junior high school student who cannot read proficiently should be given nine subjects to master and write an exams on. A senior high school student who cannot read, and we know cannot read, the teachers know cannot read, is given 10 subjects. I don't understand. If that kid cannot read, it makes sense to take away one out of the 10 courses that they are supposed to do and give them one additional English class to read and write proficiently so that they can access the content in management in living. That child is pursuing home economics, but when he entered the school, we knew that she couldn't read. But we thought that was not our responsibility, because you see, in education, 
There's this blame game that goes on all the time. Professors at universities lament about what a poor job the senior high school teachers did. And that is why when the student comes to university, they can't write. So they will lament and lambast the high school teacher and say they didn't do any good job with their kids. Look at the students who are coming to my crime. This, was good. this goes on when the lecturers meet. <laughs> Look at the students who are coming. They can't read, they can't write. Oh, the Ghana education system. And the high school teachers say, you see, the junior high school teachers, they don't do anything. Look at the students who are in high school. They can't read. And the junior high school teachers will talk about, oh, these primary school teachers, what are they doing with their children? And primary school teachers say, the KG teachers are just playing with the kids. They couldn't read when they came to us, right? And the KG teacher said, you see, the parents are watching Kung Kung Bagia with the children. <laughs> and therefore, the kids cannot read by the time they come to, oh, what a poor system. And then when the parents are able to master some courage, they will talk about, if only we got a better school building, oh, our children's future will be different, then the politician is in trouble. So we all play the blame game, but our directive at the time, at this time, is that Let's do something about it at your level. If the students get to the university and they can't write, you've done a good job accepting them by ensure that there's a writing class accessible to them. What that means is that it may mean that they may end up doing English 99, English 85, which is below level 100, but it's not your fault. Give it to them. If it means it takes one and a half years for them to graduate, it's not your fault. But by the time they leave you, they are going to write very well, and that may be the reason why they secure the job. I see people all the time who come to my office and say, we need a job. One uh, lady who came to my office, and I won't mention the university that she came from, because I don't want to get into trouble. I gave her a piece of paper, and she wrote one sentence, half a page. That was when I saw a period. Half a page. How is she going to get a job? Your ability to write is an immediate demonstration to anyone that they can hire you. So what we are saying is this. When we talk about STEM, we cannot assess STEM content when the basic foundations are not strong enough. So we have to understand that certain things must be done right for STEM to play its rightful role in the socioeconomic transformation of this nation. Let me go back to the script. <laughs> we have to address incentives for teachers in rural areas. Ghana Education Service is working on this issue, and I want them to speed it up so that that system can be created. So that there will be no school in this country without a teacher. No classroom without a teacher. Every student who enters a classroom deserves a teacher to teach them and deserve a qualified teacher. So we're working to make sure that this is the reality of the Ghanaian situation. There are times when I get phone calls from community leaders, from chiefs, who will say, out of the six teachers that are required in my village school, only three are there. And I don't think that is the way to go as a nation. So we will work with Ghana Education and work with the unions to make sure we create the right incentive to ensure that in our rural communities, we have teachers to lead the students. We also are developing a system that will allow us, student information system, which will allow us to know the attendance pattern of students from across the country. If students go, don't go to school, they can learn. And if we don't know at the Ministry of Education the attendance rate in our various districts and regions, how can we provide the oversight that is needed for the transformation of our schools? So our student information system is going to change the situation from where attendance is taken in registers and nobody does analysis of it. And if you call a district director, a district director doesn't know the attendance, the average daily attendance of the schools in his district or her district. That will be a turn of the past. The foundation has to be strong. And we need to make sure that we are using technology to ensure 
that we can provide the oversight that is needed. And once we have that foundation, where we have teachers in every classroom, where we can track attendance in every school, in every district, in every region, then we are laying a strong foundation that will make STEM education a true reality for our nation. And that will bring about the transformation that we need to see everywhere in Ghana. We also have to avert our minds to the fact that there's a yawning gap between achievements, half of our nation against the other half. The northern regions plus OT and Volta, compared to other regions in the south, if you do the analysis, you're going to see that there's a gap in outcomes. And I've been directed by the president to ensure that we bridge this gap and that the north, together with OT, and the voter region will perform as well as the South. And that will be a future that we all need to seek. Because you see, it doesn't near to anybody's benefit for parts of the country to underperform, whilst the other half does well. The whole country should be doing well. No region, no district, no community should be left behind. I've always asked myself, if you go to a community, and you look at primary four students, and if 90% of them can read and write, what will happen to that community? And if out of that 90% from primary four, 90% will get to high school. And when they get to high school, out of that, 90% will get to the university. What will happen to that village? There will be total transformation. We have received commitment from various agencies that want to support us in that agenda, in what we call the Communities of Excellence Program, to begin to take a look at how do we help communities to transform their fortunes. How do we take a community and say that we have 90% of the students reading at proficiency levels? And by the way, when we talk about that, for those of you who are gathered in this room, it may be that you can't even associate with it because your children are reading proficiently. But that is not the case. Around the world, 87% of 10-year-olds cannot read proficiently. In this country, in 2015, an assessment was done of all primary two students. And at that time, only 2% could read proficiently. And even now, we will not get more than 15% reading proficiently. That error must be over. And it should be over soon. The literacy levels will improve. But why is it that we are talking even about this in the 21st century? It's because we've not been measuring to even know what is going on. So when the primary four students age 10 does the national assessment, it is going to give us a good idea of the proficiency levels in literacy and mathematics for 10-year-olds. And that will be a wake-up call for all of us to begin to sit up and begin to do our job in such a way that the foundations will be strong enough for those students to also perform. And then, that then gives us the foundation that enables us to do STEM and do it very well. I want to lay this foundation before we move into how STEM is going to look like in the coming years. But if we don't get the foundations right, STEM education will not endure to the benefit of all. Some will progress, others will not, and will be creating two Ghanas. Ghana for the rich and Ghana for the poor. And Ghana for the poor will have talent bottle up that will never come out to be used for the total transformation of our nation. And that will not be good for our country. So when the president directed as part of the free senior high school, that top schools should receive 30% of their spaces to students who went to public school, it was to ensure that we do not create two Ghanas. That there will be one Ghana where the child of the cocoa farmer, the child of the fisher folk, will be able to gain access to fancy film or any other school, top performing school for that matter. So that agenda of the president, the free senior high school, the double track, everything that has been done is geared towards making sure that we create one Ghana. A Ghana where a child will have the opportunity to realize their fullest potential, irrespective of their parents' income status. 
Now we talk about discipline in our schools. Strong discipline regime should prevail. This morning I had the, I would say, a very sad moment talking to the parent of Sam Una Raran, a student who was stabbed to death at Konongu Dumasi. Very sad moment indeed. Group of young men thinking. A, a young man thinking is in Form 2. So he should direct what a Form 1 student should do. This has been something that has been part of our school's culture. And the time has come for it to end. Homoing is a, thing, a relic of the past. And it has no space in this century. Students go to school. And when they are new to the school and you happen to be in Form 2 or Form 3, you should be his keeper. We have to understand that we are each our brother's keeper and not our brother's oppressor. We need to make sure from one students are welcome into our schools and they are not oppressed by those who have been there for two years or three years. That homoin should not be allowed to continue it in our schools. Some have been maimed, maimed by their own kind. People who are supposed to be their friends begin to oppress them. And that environment does not allow our schools to really go for the optimum in terms of performance. Because when children are afraid every day, how can they learn and how can they achieve? So my heart goes out to the family and we are going to do everything together with the law enforcement agencies that even though we've lost a great person, a great son, justice will be done. So we want to serve this notice to all students that when you see the young one coming to your school, you are to create a welcoming environment for them and not an environment of oppression. We must strengthen our discipline system and that we will do to ensure that we have better outcomes in our schools. One area that I'll talk about before I jump into the real meat of our presentation is going to be how do we strengthen our lower secondary education level, which we call junior high school. I'm on record as saying junior high school is the weakest link in our education system. Why? Before 1987, there was something called Form 5, O level, something called CIS4. And we all remember that family. After you pass the old level, you go to A level. So we have seven years of quality secondary education. In your old level school, you get the opportunity to go to the science lab, library. You have graduate teachers there who support you. And that was the norm in this country before 1987. 1987 education reform came and our nation decided that we'll turn our back on the O and A levels and begin a new system called junior high school and senior high school. And they were going to be in different locations, which is done in some countries around the world. In some countries around the world, um, secondary education is done at one location. In some places, they are split. Lower secondary junior high school is at its own campus, and senior high school is at its own campus. Ghana decided that we're going to separate junior high school from senior high school. So the old seven-year secondary education was brought to an end. Where did we go wrong? We went wrong by not ensuring that the lower secondary had the same facilities as the senior secondary. Because the country that we borrowed this from, the United States of America, they have a junior high school system, but the facilities there are the same as the senior high school level. But we decided that with a uh, stroke of a pen, overnight, every village woke up and they had a high school in their village. Junior high school is high school. So all villages got junior high school. Some got about five of them. We did not even think in terms of consolidating them. We left the old middle schools that were elementary schools we ran down buildings and we call them, you are now secondary. We never look back to change that. 
So you go to various villages with about 11 junior high schools. None of them has a library. Nine of them has a science lab. And they wear the same uniforms as the primary school students. But we say to them, whether you like it or not, you are high school. Therefore, you are junior high. But if you ask anybody on the street and you ask them, how many years of high school do we have in Ghana? Invariably, you hear people say three years because they don't recognize the junior high as high school, and rightly so. Unless we do something about this and strengthen the weak middle, lift up the lower secondary in such a way that we can really give them the facilities and the requisite tools to truly do secondary education, our secondary education is going to be three years. When we do the three-year secondary without lifting up the lower secondary to combine and give a six, we've created a very weak education system. And that is why the president has directed that I work on it. And we've, together with stakeholders, we're setting up a committee into dialogue with the country and dialogue with ourselves to ensure that we can strengthen the lower secondary and make it truly secondary. There's one model that we are building. And in that time where we are building this model, a huge building, which is going to be a junior high school. It is going to replace 11 old middle school buildings that we call junior high school when that building is done. All those 11 schools will be decommissioned. There will be no longer secondary school students in them. They all move into this new building, and when they move into that building, what is going to happen is that they're going to have opportunity to do biology, chemistry, and fixes, and they have a computer lab, they have a library, and everything that is in the high school will be in that space. Consequently, when you talk about STEM, it's going to be possible to do STEM. You can't talk about STEM, you can't talk about robotics when there's no electricity. When the building is falling apart, we can't talk about STEM. We can't tell the kids that you can compete with anybody anywhere in the world. But we are not giving you the facility that will make that possible. So STEM is predicated on the fact that we'll do a fantastic job with not just teacher training, but also with infrastructure. And by the way, Ghana has one of the finest group of teachers anywhere in the world. We have teachers who are so committed to their profession. If we put them in the right space and give them the requisite tools that the president is determined to do, the Ghanaian teacher will shine. And you clap for them. But the Ghanaian teacher is not going to shine when you ask them to do robotics and you ask them to teach computers with no computer. So we, as a government, we are truly committed to making sure the Ghanaian teacher gets the requisite tools. To make sure the Ghanaian teacher is provided opportunity pro for professional development professional learning communities. Provided opportunity for professional development and training as part of the school's instructional calendar. I met a, a teacher friend of mine at a high school and I asked him, how many times have you done professional development? He said, I have to pay to go and get training. And I said to myself, this is not right. As employers, we need to ensure that there's time set aside for the teacher to be trained. These are the foundations that have to be right in order for us to begin to look at how do we use STEM for transformation. So the infrastructure that we are doing is to reform systems that are already in place in our regular schools as we also build facilities that will ensure that STEM can truly be practiced. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is a response, our nation's response to the fourth industrial revolution. That is our education 4.0, an education system that will see to it. That in our high schools, teachers are located in the classrooms, and students go to visit them. In the current regime, students are in the classroom and the teachers are guests of the students. So you walk into a classroom, and you see the walls of the school, and these are top-level schools. 
And um, you see on the walls are written various words. Lomoto was here. Jojo was here, 1999. Kojo Mensa was here some. And it will all be inscribed on the walls. And sometimes I look at it and say, wow, the classroom environment is so boring. So we are changing that. In the next 10 schools that we are operationalizing, you are going to see the teachers in the classrooms. You are going to see the smart screens, smart boards in the classroom. You are going to see all the artifacts provided so that the teacher can perform and perform creditably. There are a number of schools, and I'll mention their names to you. If you happen to be in one of those areas, you can see what the president has done. So, we call these schools, and the classroom blocks is called the V blocks. They are shaped like a V, and great things are happening there. If you visit Abomosu in the eastern region, you visit Pasempe in the northeast region, Kwadaso in Ashanti region, Daba, Awaso, Weja, Kwansi, Diaso, Deduako in the Bosomchen district. You are going to see schools that are well constructed, schools whose architecture is second to none in Ghana and competes very well with others around the world. In each one of these schools, whether it's the Kwadaso Creative Arts High School or the other STEM schools, there will be 12 science labs in the school. Four chemistry labs, four biology labs, four physics labs, and in addition to that, you're going to have four computer labs. Uh, this is the shape of the V block. This one is under construction. I think there are a few that have uh, that have been completed, and we are getting ready to operationalize some of them. Look at the buildings. This is the V block. Uh, this is one of the buildings at Pasempe in the northeast region. These are full-fledged boarding schools built by the present government to ensure that children can come here from all corners of the country. We have also ensured that in areas where there are eight blocks, and there are no dorms. Of course, if blocks didn't come with dorms. There are no facilities for students to come there and for the schools to be operationalized. We are building dormitory blocks so that the e blocks can also be operationalized for the benefit of the Ghanaian student. Those resources that were used in building the e blocks were the resources of this nation. And the president has directed that we do everything possible to ensure that in cases where the e blocks were not built in the middle of town, and the schools cannot be open because students cannot just walk there. As is the case of Drobonso. If you go to Drobonso, the e-block is in the middle of nowhere. And it's difficult for you to... We attempted to open the school. We only got three students. Nobody would select there because they can't even walk from the nearest town to the school. But the government is not going to wait for that investment to be wasted and therefore... If you go to Drobonso today, a girl's dormitory block is nearing completion. A boy's dormitory block is also about to be completed. And once those dormitory blocks are completed, we are going to open the Drobonso e-block facility as a full-fledged boarding school for the benefit of this country. I want to assure the good people of Ghana that when it comes to education and with Dr. Dutchman as the minister, led by the President of the Republic, there's no politics. President Kufo built upgraded and upgraded schools. President Mills and President John Mahama brought about community senior high schools. Great idea. We came, we continued. A number of schools have been completed. Those who, that we, is, is becoming difficult to operationalize we are adding boarding facilities in Sara, in the Northwest. We have provided boarding facility. And next academic year, the girls will have a dormitory block so that they don't have to come all the way from the villages to find a place to rent and go to school. They, too, will be boarders and they will benefit from the government because we believe it's the right thing to do. So we we'll build on the legacy of President Mills, legacy of President Mahama, and then move on to building 
full-fledged boarding schools as we also operationalize some of the e-blocks that they built. We believe as a nation, education should see incremental growth and transformation irrespective of who is in power. Education is the precept of everyone. It doesn't matter your political uh, allegiance or uh, uh, line. You should be able to go to school and enjoy the benefits of your nation. And therefore, we do not take decisions with a political hat on. We take decisions to ensure that we can truly transform this country. Transformation of this country is something that should concern all of us. Nanano, distinguished guest, I believe all of you will want to see Ghana transform in our lifetime. And it will be sad that our generation will not do the transformation agenda. Our generation will do the transformation agenda, and I believe it will come with the support of all. The leadership of Nananom and political leaders and academic leaders will all come to Ghana and be, uh, come to uh, understand that Ghana will need our effort, combined effort, so that we can change this country once and for all. So the STEM schools that are under construction, as I've already indicated to you, are located across the length and breadth of this nation. It's going to recruit students from the four corners of the country into those schools to make sure that they too can benefit from the investment of the president, the investment of government, and the investment of your good selves as the tax payers. In order for this to be realized, we are working with NTC, of course, that is the AFL, National Teaching Council, is looking at how they can develop the framework for STEM teacher certification. STEM teacher certification will enable us to prepare the requisite manpower teachers that will be needed to run the schools. We're also looking at training of leaders, leaders who will run not just STEM schools, but all schools across the country. That is why we are going to establish the National Education Institute to train the future headmasters and headmistresses of our nation so that they will have the requisite skills to lead our nation and have the requisite skills to ensure that they will be able to employ the strategies that is very much needed for STEM to be implemented well. We are committed to dealing with disparities in a disparity that exists we we'll work to make sure that throughout the length and breadth of this nation, if a group of people, through no fault of their own, do not have the resources to move up, it will be our responsibility to ensure that they do. Because as I have just alluded to earlier, it's not about them, but it's about us as a nation tapping into their talent so that we can use their talent to transform the nation. I've always asked my friends, that if they look at WhatsApp, for example, and the revenue, the value of WhatsApp, billions of dollars in terms of its value. I've asked people that, imagine if the person who did WhatsApp and invented WhatsApp was a Ghanaian, what will happen to Ghana? A lot of revenue will be coming here. Probably the person will be paying 50%, contributing 50% of all the money that we need to transform ourselves as a nation. So the 21st century transformation will not necessarily come from some physical resources. What will bring about transformation is the human brain and how we nurture it and how we motivate it, how we encourage it, how we bring and nurture individuals for them to realize that there are better days ahead of them and not behind them. Invariably, some people talk about the good old days. The good old days without talking about the better days ahead of us as a nation. I want all of us to begin to develop our self-efficacy to understand that we can do it. I always tell people that the gift I got from America was not a gift of education or the gift of maybe financial resources. It was the gift of understanding that if you believe, you can. That there's nothing that the human mind cannot do. And I want all of us to begin to understand that this nation's fortunes are going to be better. It's better ahead of us and not behind us. And it's, we make it as we want it. 
We make it as we want it. We can together follow the leadership of many and do a better job for our nation. So today I'm so excited I'm here at Academic City. I came to see this school when it was under construction. I had a wonderful opportunity of meeting with the innovators who actually brought this school to Ghana. And I saw their vision at the time, and I knew what they wanted to do, and I was therefore happy to support them. We need more academic city, university colleges across this country. The kind of work that is being done here, the innovation that is being done here, is the innovation we want to see at all our universities. And once we do that, we can transform uh, this nation. But also cannot just talk about STEM at the universities without talking about STEM at KG level, primary school level, junior high school level, high school. Basically, we need to create a pipeline of STEM. Pipeline from KG all the way to the universities. And when that pipeline is created, that is when the transformation happens. In other jurisdictions around the world, students don't wait till they are in the university to talk about aviation science. They start from KG. And no schools that are visited that talk about aeronautical sciences from primary school. So when the students begin immersing themselves in aviation, immersing themselves in engineering, at that early age, by the time they get to high school, they know more than somebody who may have started engineering at the university. And those are the students, when they get to the university space, they are not there to memorize some notes for the professor. They are not there to take notes from. They are there to say, Prof, it can be done differently. When I was in high school, I did a project on this. And that is what we want to see in our university lecture halls. Lecture halls where the students will bring in, be bring, bringing great ideas to the discourse. Lecture halls where students will say, I think I can do this. We can invent something. And that is what we want to see at the universities, but we cannot get there without beginning from the lower level possible and providing an avenue for students to get to that destination. We cannot get there if we do not look at gifted and talented education, something that other countries have done and it has benefited them tremendously. Hong Kong, South Korea, United States of America, they have all done gifted and talented education. And what is it? Have you seen a child on the street who has invented something and you are fascinated by it? We all see it on social media all the time. We see a student who built a car and, and people were fascinated. And they were saying, wow, this student is a genius. And sometimes uh, they will forward it to education minister. And I get it and I look at it and I get frustrated because I don't have a gate school for this child. We are now working with cabinet and very soon we'll continue with our stakeholder engagement to make sure that gifted and talented education will become part of the Ghanaian education ecosystem. <laughs> you see, research has shown that 5% of every population anywhere in the world is highly gifted. 5%. It also shows that 10% of the population, irrespective of where they were born, are gifted or talented, or gifted and talented. Some of them may be special needs students. And sometimes we don't think they are gifted. Tell you the story of a young man called Gordon Butler. I had a wonderful opportunity of working with him from primary six all the way to high school. Gordon Butler walked into my school, and he had to take a placement exam, and Gordon Butler froze. He couldn't write. He couldn't write. And the mom came to me, the dad actually brought him for the placement exam in one of my schools, and he came to me and said, my son is so smart, I don't know why he's crying and will not write. Gordon Butler was autistic. But when Gordon Butler came to my school, we began weekly learning celebration where we recognized students who were doing well in school. And Gordon was always the best student in mathematics and science. Week upon week, he was getting awards. But he was struggling in English and history. He could not write well. In all exams, we had to give him more time. Homework and classwork assignment, Gordon Butler had to get more time. We crafted an individualized education plan for Gordon Butler. 
Long story short, by the time he reached 12th grade, when he was graduating from my school, he was the top performing student in history and English. Because the school created an opportunity for him to grow, and boy, he uh, grow, growing he did. Today, Gordon Butler is a mechanical engineer. But his story probably wouldn't have been the same had it not been in a system where every student with learning disability had an opportunity for their talents to be brought out through the crafting of our individualized education plan. So as we embark on the STEM agenda, we embark on it without thinking about just those who we think perceive to be gifted and we're not looking at those who may be gifted, but their giftedness is not coming out because they may have a disability. So we need to all avert our minds to the fact that we have work to do. And gifted and talented education, including those who may have a learning disability may, uh, that may still be gifted, will be something that will promote as a nation. And very soon, as we dialogue more and look at the way to go, we are going to create a gate education program that will ensure that the very people with, gifted, with gifts and talents who are gifted and are talented are leading and that we are creating an environment for them so that their talents can be used for the benefit of our nation. If God has given us these individuals in our midst, people who can innovate and create, and we are not giving them the opportunity and creating the environment, it's our loss as a nation. And we will not continue to lose out on the great talent that is bottled up in certain individuals. You probably may have heard me talk about my favorite group of, pe group of people in high school, those who are doing visual arts. Visual arts students. Why am I talking about them all the time? There's a young man called Kojo Mensa. He had a dream. And in the dream, he was speaking with God. Very interesting encounter with God. God called, uh, called Kojo Mensa and said, Kojo. And he said, God, and he said, you know, you're going to be the world's best engineer. And he said, God, you don't know me. And God said, I know, I created you. Why do you say I don't know you? He said, God, I'm a young man growing up in Ghana. I'm in high school, and I'm doing visual arts, so I will never be an engineer. But God knew that Kojo Mensa was going to travel to America. And when he goes to America, he will be allowed to do engineering. What is stopping us? From allowing Kojo Mensa's dream to come true and become the world's best engineer, as God told him. So I'm excited that we are working with GTEC and selected universities to look at creating a pre-engineering program for those who did not do science in high school, especially those who did visual arts. You see, if that young man and that woman who can look at you and draw you, can draw bridges and design cars, cannot do engineering, who are engineers? When we ask those young men and women who can draw and innovate, and sometimes we push them into it, and in the process they develop their unique talents and they can design, they can do a whole lot of things. But we say, uh-uh. Yes, you need them to know physics, you need them to know chemistry, you need them to know advanced mathematics, but why can't you create a pre-engineering program where they can prove to you that I can do the math and I can do chemistry and I can do mathematics, I can do physics, and if they can prove to you, what stops you from allowing them? What do you lose? Me, I don't understand. <laughs> I, I really don't understand. I don't understand why you should put barriers in the way of talent and talented individuals. So Ghana is going to see a new dawn in that area to make sure we can put all our talents to use for the benefit of this country. Instead of saying no to them, say yes and motivate them. And I want that to be the work that we all do. So, coming back to STEM again. In the high schools, there's going to be a new pathway. We are working on this. You know, we always talk about, maybe you've heard the story of making sure 60% 
of the university's enrollment is in the STEM fields, right? Have we all heard that? We, hear, we write those speeches for presidents to read all the time. We lie to them all the time. My professor is laughing. We lie. We, did, we do a national strate education strategic plan and we say that 60% of all students in the universities will be pursuing STEM. Recently, I asked my directors, the one in charge of the Kowa stream, right? Research. Divine. I asked Divine, come with, uh, give me some data on the percentage of students who are pursuing science at the high school. And it's averaging about 12%. How do you change 12% to 60%? I don't understand. You go to Savannah region, and only 4% of the students are doing science. How do you change 4% to about 60%? It's impossible. But we'll be lying to ourselves. Unless we create an opportunity for more students to per pursue science at the high school level, the universities cannot be held accountable for increasing STEM enrollment to 60%. We can't hold them accountable to something that we have not created an opportunity for them to do. And that is why we need to begin to look at how do we create also a STEM pathway. In addition to the science, can we have some students pursuing computer science, pursuing engineering, pursuing aviation and aeronautical sciences at the high school level? So that together we have a large pool of Ghanaian young men and women who are exposed to STEM at the high school level. And that is what will give us the opportunity to create the 60% that we are looking for at the university level. So you're going to see various pathways created. Students who have opportunity to pursue programming, computer science, and, and, and do network engineering as electives at the high school level. And that is where the symbiosis between TVET and STEM becomes very clear. Because TVET students will pursue engineering, and those who are in our regular so-called grammar schools will also pursue engineering. Because if they are going to the university and from our grammar school they can do engineering, what stops us from introducing engineering to them at the high school level? So they can do engineering drawing at the high school, and built into this, the universities can create an accelerated learning program. So if that student did engineering drawing in high school, why should they re, um, do engineering drawing at the university at the same time? So by the time they get to the university, there may be some engineering courses that the universities can waive for them to accelerate the education adventure. I know a number of students who have tried to do the WASI at the end of Form 2. I know we frown on that, and even there's a GS policy against that. But the students are saying to us, why are you wasting my time? I think I know enough by the end of year two. And we are saying, no, you can't. You better not. And if you do, we we'll expel you from the school. Some students have been suspended for that. But in other places around the world, there's opportunity for acceleration in such a way that if you're super bright, there are some advanced courses that you can take. And in exchange for that, the universities will give you opportunity to skip some of the level 100 courses because you can demonstrate proficiency that in fact you know what they are teaching. And even in Ghana, there's an exam that is done by business students. And if you pass it, it's a WASI a type of exam done by WAEC. If you pass it, you can skip level 100 in business school. So it's not me to this country. But why are we not creating similar opportunities for other people?